All right. And just so everybody's uh, aware, I am going to be live streaming this on YouTube as well. Just struggling with uh, struggling with it a little bit. Was nervous I wasn't going to be able to do it. Um, so this webinar will be recorded um, and it will be live streamed to YouTube as well. They won't be able to see the chat box interactions on YouTube, um, but um, just so you know, that's another uh, avenue where it's going to be shared. All right. Hello, Leslie from Alaska. Hello, Donna from Illinois. Wonderful. Ah, Deb. Hello. Good to see you. See you. Joe. Wonderful. Lots of familiar faces here. Yeah. And so as Christine's saying, please select all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comment. Um, We'll say it a hundred times. It's kind of a, it's the bane of my existence that Zoom doesn't default you all to just sharing it with everybody. Um, but um, so we'll repeat that over and over. But we want to make sure everybody's engaging in the chat and everybody's seeing um, everyone's messages. All right, we got Southbury Library here from Southbury, Connecticut. Becky from Queens Public Library. Joe, it's always good to see you on a webinar. All right, Kim. Kim, good to see you. Wonderful. <laughs> Let me see quite a few Oklahoma City folks in there. Awesome. Well, y'all, it's uh, 1 o'clock Mountain Time, uh, so we are ready to get started. Um, today's webinar is entitled Virtual Night Sky Programs for Imagine Your Story. Um, so we know that 2020 has been pretty crazy so far, and that 2020 summer reading um, is, is going to be you know, fun and crazy and exciting too. And this Imagine Your Story theme is really, really, really something that you can still build upon as a library. Uh, so I'm with the Star Library Network. Most of you all have probably been to a webinar before or you've heard of the Star Library Network. If not, we'll share some of your resources. But we're always kind of thinking about ways that you can give things a, a STEM twist at your library. Um, and so we've worked with our partners at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Uh, we have a friend joining us from the Pasadena Public Library that we'll talk to in just a minute. Um, and we just have a great group of folks today here to talk to you about how you can still do some virtual night sky programs and how you can tie that into the Imagine Your Story theme. So a few little housekeeping things to keep in mind. Um, if you want to find your toolbar, um, you're probably seeing a little uh, notification of the chat box coming up. Um, that's going to be probably at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it's at the top of your screen too. Um, so you can pull that. You can click on the chat. There should also be a Q&A button there, and there should be a polls button there. We're going to be utilizing both of those features today. Um, so the next uh, step two there says click the audio, join, by, uh, join audio, um, join by computer. You can also dial in by phone. Most people choose not to, but we do have phone numbers um, in these first few slides for you. Um, of course, if you're hearing me talk right now, you've probably already figured out how to join by audio. Find the chat box. Um, I'll say it once, I'll say it 500 times. Make sure you are sharing to all panelists and attendees. Um, uh, the default is to go only to the panelists and we want everybody to see your message. Um, so please don't get annoyed when I say it a bunch and, um, and, and don't uh, be offended if we, we remind you in the chat a few times. All right, so I want to take a moment to introduce everybody, and I think everybody's video is going to pop up, and they're going to say hello now. Uh, first, we have Christine Schupla from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. You may have seen her on a StarNet webinar before. Next, we have Sherelle Webb from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Uh, I used to think of you as a newbie at LB, LPI, but you've been there for a while now, so you're not really a noob anymore. Um, and loads and loads of experience in education as well. Uh, lastly, our, uh, we also have Sophia, um, who is friends of... Liliana and Belinda from the Pasadena Public Library. Uh, so Sophia is going to be joining us. Uh, that's Sophia in the middle. And she's going to be asking some questions. going to try to help us kind of model what an actual virtual night sky program might look like. So we're really, really excited. It's going to be fun to have some uh, and, and one extra guest uh, joining us. And so I'll, uh, I'm Brooks Mitchell from the Star Library Network. Um, you've probably seen me on webinars before. Um, and I'm just kind of here to say hello and introduce all these wonderful presenters. And you won't be hearing too much from me today. Thanks, Brooke. We're glad to be here. Yeah. All right. So we'll hear from everybody in just a moment. We'll come back to them. Uh, just a few expectations and guidelines. Um, try to use the Q&A feature for your questions. 
um, that is that little Q&A button. You can put your questions in the chat box. There's just a good chance that they might get lost. There's, you know, 95 folks in here. Uh, there's going to be a lot of chat box interaction. So if you want to make sure that your messages are being seen or are, are going to be addressed, put them in that Q&A function. Uh, lastly, I have a note here. Some of us are for working from home, so, you know, things might happen. You might hear a dog bark or a car horn honk, just, or, you know, or we could have some internet issues. Um, please be just patient with us, and as I know you always are. Uh, I will, I'll put the link here in just a moment, or maybe Greg, if you're in the chat box, you could put this link. We do have our resource list for this webinar is on our blog. So Greg just dropped it right in there. Uh, you can't click into the screen. So I do have a little bit.ly uh, shortened hyperlink if you want to access it that way, or you can go to just scarnetlibraries.org. You can go to our blog page, which is under our resources, or you can click on the link in the chat box. So for those of you on YouTube live, if you're watching right now, if you go to scarnetlibraries.org resources blog, you'll find our link bank for this webinar here. So I do want to talk really briefly. Some of you have probably heard about these resources, um, but just some resources that you can utilize from Starnet. We might not be referring to them too much today, so I want to go ahead and get my little plug in. Our Steam Ahead at Home initiative is designed for libraries that are dealing with, um, well, all libraries are dealing with, you know, this COVID-19 response in ways that you can still bring Steam programming to your patrons. So it's kind of a three-pronged approach, our Steam Ahead at Home initiative. We have our Families at Home section. Uh, which is um, uh, things that you can share directly with your patrons. There's no facilitator required. So it's a sheet you can post on your Facebook. You can email out. You can say, hey, y'all should try this at home. Um, knowing that not a, a lot of activities that we have on our STEM Activity Clearinghouse are designed for facilitator use. So, so these are things that you can send directly to your families. That refresh your skills section in the middle, that's to help you in your librarianship uh, and, to, and to improve your skills as an uh, informal educator. So it's uh, old webinars. It's other training materials that we think are helpful um, if you do have some time on your hands to do some training. Virtual programs are activities and resources designed um, kind of like what we're talking about today. If you want to do a virtual program, whether that's on Facebook Live or whether that's through Zoom for your patrons, um, that's going to be a good uh, resource to check out. So again, that's our SEMA Head at Home initiative. If you're already getting our Star Library Network newsletter, then you're probably getting this as well. All of our stuff is free. I should mention that. Uh, our STEM Activity Clearinghouse, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. You probably already know what it is. We have 400 plus activities uh, that are designed for an interactive use in a library setting. Um, so, so it's not school activities. It's not museum activities. It's activities that work well in a library setting. You can sort those by a few different parameters like the time, the cost, the age group, uh, the mess level. And we also have our own customized collections where we've taken and kind of curated some activities um, and put them into a collection that we think would fit for you. So we have like an Imagine Your Story collection, for example. Lastly, I just wanted to put a quick plug for our YouTube page. And hello to everybody that's watching this on YouTube now. You've already discovered our YouTube page. Just click on that Starnet logo. Um, but we keep a lot of really cool resources here, a lot of how-to videos for interactive activities. Some of those are designed for direct-to-patron use. You could distribute those to patrons. That's where we keep a lot of our archived webinar recordings. And we also have some inspirational videos of STEM in action. So um, uh, people that are actually doing STEM in their job, um, uh, inspiring role models you could show to younger patrons. Uh, and then we have some videos on there as well about the STEM and libraries movement. So it's really easy uh, URL to follow there, youtube.com slash starnet libraries. I uh, hope you go and check that resource out. All right, I want to launch a poll question to kind of get us started here. Um, let me, let's see. Yes, here, here's your poll question. What are your favorite hero stories? Okay. So thinking about Greek mythology, right? Like Poseidon, Ulysses. Um, obviously, I don't know a ton about Greek mythology because that's like the only two examples I have in my head. Um, uh, stories from other cultures, modern movies, or something else, say it in the chat. And we'll give you guys maybe 10, 15 more seconds. All right, we're going to do five, four, three, because I'm already cutting into Sherelle's time. Two, one. All right, here's what we got. Stories from other cultures this is the winner. We got Greek hero stories after that, modern movies, and I saw some cool stuff coming in the chat. Avenger movies, uh, Gandhi, Norse, Norse heroes, old princess stories, old fairy tales. Very cool. Keep on putting those in the chat. Uh, I want to go ahead and turn things over um, to the wonderful Sherelle Webb. Sherelle's going to actually get us started with a hands, uh, with an interactive activity, kind of keep things fresh and switch it up for you. Sherelle, sorry I cut into your time a little bit. I'm signing yeah, off. 
Take You're perfectly fine. Thank you, Brooks, for that wonderful uh, introduction and, uh, and the housekeeping items. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name again is Sherelle Webb, and I'm going to show you an interactive activity that reinvents constellations. So I'm going to show you my what I've created. All right, and basically what you're seeing here, um, normally the activity will be done with a uh, cereal or anything that you can grab at home that can make different shapes. You can take a handful of them, dump them on a sheet of paper, a blank paper like I have here, and it, it decides to create a shape or a figure of something. So the purpose of this activity will be to help develop storytelling and writing skills. So once the items are laid out, you can then start drawing and connecting them in a way to form a constellation. And the beauty about this is that there's no right or wrong way of connecting the constellation. You see that? Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So, so that particular activity is, uh, is the Sky Heroes activity that we provided a link to. And um, one of the things that you need to know, oh, let's go ahead and see Sophia's. Um, Lily, can you go ahead and show us Sophia's video? And, uh, awesome. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, your microphone is turned off. Go ahead and turn on your microphone. She uh, dropped on some scrap pieces of paper. See, and look at what I made. Yep. I made a fishy. She made a fishy. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, you can drop pieces of paper like like uh, what Sophia did. Um, you can drop pieces of cereal if you happen to have like Cheerios at home or M and M's or can other candies, um, and then and then use that to design your own little uh, sky hero. So this is a modification of the Sky Hero activity. Thank you so much, um, Sophia. We appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and I am going to start to share um, a. Uh, I'm going to start to share just a couple of slides before we get into Stellarium. So Sky Heroes is one of the activities that we're going to demonstrate using um, Sky Heroes. And let's go ahead and show this. Uh, what we've got here, Stellarium is a free open source planetarium software that you might be able to, might be interested in using. And um, it shows a realistic sky and we're gonna demonstrate it and kind of go over some details in just a second. Um, the, uh, it's one of many different programs out there. This is the one we're using. However, you might have others that are also your favorites and please feel free to make comments about which programs, if you are using one yourself already, which ones are your favorites for using virtually with audiences? Stellarium and these other programs have a variety of options. They, we can change the date, the location, the time, we can show constellations and artwork. And so these are some of the different things that we are going to be doing with this program to highlight stories about the night sky. And there's a number of constellations we're going to be going into. So I'm going to stop sharing that. And I am going to uh, move that out of the way. And now we are going to start sharing Stellarium. Hold on, let's. Um, where did it go? Too many things on my screen. All right, so Stellarium, as I mentioned, is a software that you can use. And so I'm going to, share it now. And um, I hope, I know somebody earlier was having trouble seeing Sherelle's camera. I hope that you can all see uh, the screen. Um, how's that going? Sophia, can you see what I'm showing on the screen? Yeah. Hey. Awesome. And I'm going to move this gray screen out of the way so it's not blocking your view of anything here. Make it a little bit bigger. And your question. you can probably see my mouse. I'm going to zoom out, the first thing I'm going to do, and I'm just gonna use my mouse uh, to zoom out like this 
so that we can see more of the sky. And then I'm going to tilt my sky like we're leaning back in a lawn chair so we can see even more of it. And the Stellarium has some different menus that you might be interested in using. One is over here on the left hand side. When I mouse over the left, it brings up several options. And then the other menu is on the bottom. When I mouse over the bottom, it brings up a variety of options. So over on the left, I'm going to, um, the location I could use to change where I am. Right now you see the red arrows over here in Houston. And so it's showing the sky as it would be seen, ignoring weather. <laughs> it doesn't know if we've got cloudy weather, which we often do. Um, ignoring weather, it, um, it, it's showing where the sun is in the sky, where the stars are in the sky from Houston right now. Um, but I could change this to show you what we would be seeing from the North Pole or the South Pole, other places around the world. Um, the date and time, this is the one I use the most often. So right now, it's today, it's June the 18th, and my computer knows that it is 214. So that's what time it is showing where the sun and the moon are in the sky. I am going to change this so that we can see the sunset. Y'all ready? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to let the sun set over there in the west. It's gonna set in the northwest because it is in June right now and let it get dark and let the stars come out. Ooh. Now, um, one of the other things I'm going to do is I'm gonna change it right now. It's showing the names of the bright stars. I'm going to turn off the names of the bright stars and the planets because we are going to instead use something here to find things. So right now I'm showing you uh, uh, tonight, the sky, if it's gonna be clear, I don't know if it's going to be clear, facing towards the south. I'm going to use my mouse to turn us around. So we're turning around and facing north. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit for the stars here in the north. And I am going to invite Sophia. Sophia, do you happen to see the Big Dipper there in the sky? Oh, see, I see it really. And Sophia, we have Be some good. tools. We have it tools. Almost looks what does it look like? Do you see it? Uh, it looks like, like a sartén, a pen. <laughs> awesome. Sophia, would you like to use the annotate tool? Um, and that annotate tool, if you mouse over the controls, you'll see that you have the ability to draw using annotate and um, on, on the computer screen. And I'd like you to try drawing where you think the Big Dipper is. And while you're doing okay. that, I'll let Sherelle do the same thing as well. So we're gonna have a couple different people annotate now and draw where they think the Big Dipper is. That one. Uh oh. I see a drawing. Now, one of the problems with annotate is that we don't know whether this is being annotated by Sherelle or by Sophia. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, um, Annotate is a marvelous tool that you can use, but it's also anonymous, which means that you don't want to necessarily allow annotation if you might have somebody lurking on your program who might draw something inappropriate or accidentally draw something that maybe shouldn't be shared. So, um, but we can use it and we're using it now for this idea of constellation detectives. People might know what the Big Dipper looks like, and we've just invited them to draw the Big Dipper. And Constellation Detectives is an activity that you can do virtually. You can share pictures and ask the kids to draw where they think the constellation is. Or you can hand out at your library as a make and take the different pictures, have them take it home, and have them draw in person some of the things and then share what the constellations actually are. So this idea of, of finding and drawing the constellations, we've got a drawing there for the Big Dipper. Now you don't have to rely on their drawings for the Big Dipper. You can, out, you, and you can of course, in annotate, you can also erase things. Um, Sherelle, would you mind um, erasing our Big Dipper drawing there? And 
I'm going to use Stellarium here to add some constellation lines. And in these constellation lines, you can see, in addition to the Big Dipper, we've got several other lines here. The Big Dipper is actually an asterism. It's part of a much bigger constellation called the Great Bear. So, um, and the, we can draw pictures as well. So we have a bear there. Um, well, that looks undo, cool. Does it look pretty cool? I'm gonna undo the bear for just a second and show you how we can use the Big Dipper to find the North Star. So here we've got three stars for the handle of the Big Dipper. And we have four stars. I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer so you can see it better. Three stars for the handle and then four stars for the bowl of the Big Dipper. Different people around the world have had different stories about the Big Dipper. Um, in England, it's been known as the plow uh, um, or it's sometimes called a wagon. Um, some of the, the Inuit up in Alaska um, said that this parts of the stars uh, of the Big Dipper here is a bear that's being chased by three hunters. Um, but these two stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper that are furthest from the handle, their names are Merak and Doobie. And if we go five times their distance, Merak, Doobie, 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 Doo, you get to the North Star. You might notice that the North Star is not very bright. It's not the brightest star in the sky. It's not even in the top 20. It is always directly over the North Pole of the Earth, at least for the next few thousand years. And um, oh, Miss Christine, Miss Christine, yes. the north, that, that's where Santa Claus lives. That is indeed where Santa Claus lives, is up north. And you can see right here that, that North Star is right over the North Pole. And if we happened to change our location, if we decided that we wanted to go visit the North Pole briefly, well, first of all, this time of year, the North Pole doesn't have sunset. The sun is up all the time. So it's hard to see the stars in the sky this time of year. So I'm going to change my month really quickly here. I'm going to go towards Christmas time. And I changed our position again to be up there at the very North Pole. And now let's see if we can find that North Star. So we're looking south. Of course, from the North Pole, every direction is south, frankly. Um, and we're going to look way up there, high in the sky, and try to find that North Star right up there, right overhead. See how high it is? And as the night goes by, all the stars are going to go around it, and it's going to be right overhead for Santa Claus. Whereas <laughs> back here in Houston, I'm going to change, I'm going to change that arrow there. It should let me move the arrow. It's being difficult. Okay, well, I'm just going to go back to Houston. I'm going to search for Houston. I'm just gonna to return to default. There we go. Okay. And um, now though, it changed everything. Anyone know why it changed? So earlier the Big Dipper was up here and it's not up here anymore. Sophia, do you know why the Big Dipper isn't here anymore? What happened? Um, it, it, we're, I don't see it no more. I don't see it no more. We moved. Kelly says we moved. It was up here and it's not up here anymore. What else huh. did we do besides we moved to the North Pole, then we went back to Houston, but we did something else besides going to the North Pole. We changed the time. Like the That's season? We changed the season. Emily says we moved to December and Jennifer says we changed the date. So let's go back to not just the location, but let's go back to our dates. And we're going to go back to June. That's the summertime. Summertime, back to summertime. And so now that we're back in June, there our Big Dipper is. Okay. Oh, there it is. I see it. It's right there. So it can, ladies and gentlemen, it can get easy to get lost as you're changing dates and times, just to let you know. Um, so here we have the Big Dipper, which is part of Ursa Major, that big bear. And I wanted to tell you a story now about our bear and her long tail. See, once upon a time, and this is a modern story. There's lots of different stories, right? You can have stories from ancient times and from multiple cultures, modern stories and made up stories. 
This story is one I've been hearing for more than 20 years, but it is very modern. So the story says that once upon a time, our bear was out wandering in the woods and she was having breakfast. Well, she saw there was a man having breakfast in the woods. He was camping and he had a beautiful breakfast with pancakes and eggs and all sorts of wonderful things. And the bear, she decided she wanted some of that breakfast. So she went over and she started gobbling down his breakfast. Nom, 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 nom. Well, the man said, leave my breakfast alone. I made that for me. You can't have any, it's for me. And the bear kept gobbling it up. Nom, 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 nom. And she was about to eat all his breakfast. And this man said, you better leave my breakfast alone. Honestly, this is going to be a problem. And the bear kept ignoring him. And he said, do you know who I am? I'm Hercules, leave my breakfast alone, last chance. And the bear, she finished gobbling down all his breakfast. And he was so mad, he reached over and he grabbed that bear by her stubby little tail. He grabbed it and he started swinging her around and around and around and around and around and he let go and she flew up and got stuck in the sky. Except her tail was all stretched out. Do you That's believe that story? Cool. That's not it sounds nice. good to me. No. <laughs> well, um, the bear is up there in the sky and she's not very far away from Hercules. Hercules is a summertime constellation that's high in the sky during the summertime. And um, it might be hard to see that picture in real life. Hercules, his stars to me, to me, his stars look like the letter H. You've got one side of the H Right, let's go ahead and let's annotate. Let's annotate and draw that H. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to do a nice drawing here. I was always taught Hercules as this letter H in the sky. And that's how I find him. Cause otherwise he's kind of hard to see. Otherwise he doesn't really look much like a letter H. Otherwise he kind of, he, 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 he looks, in some drawings he looks more like a square that somebody sat on and broke. Um, <laughs> so um but yeah that's hercules up there in the sky i'm going to stop annotating now and i am going to i'm gonna do this so that you can see these a little bit better here these these drawings i had something in the way so here's the lines doesn't really look much like a person but it's supposed to be hercules the hero and there's his picture there. And in this picture, he's fighting with some serpents with Hydra. And again, he's not far from the big bear or some major. There's lots of different versions and stories about why the bear is in the sky and why her tail is so long. I just wanted to share that particular one with you. Yep, Brooks said he might get mad if somebody took his breakfast too. Okay, <laughs> I am um, going to zoom out a little bit. So we were facing north so we could see the Big Dipper. And here you can see the, big, the Little Dipper as well. The Little Dipper is actually much harder to see because many of these stars are pretty faint. And so when you're in a city like Houston or Pasadena, um, you might only see the North Star and these two other stars uh, because of the city lights. But if you're far away from the city lights, you might be able to see all of them. The Little Dipper is oh. part of a little bear or some minor. Ms. Yes, Christine, so, so yes. if I go camping, I might see them? If you go camping, you might be able to see these stars. They're much easier to see when you go camping. Absolutely, that's a great idea. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back out again a little bit. We're facing north and I shared the Big Dipper Ursa Major and the Little Dipper Ursa Minor. Now I'm going to turn us around to face the south. Everybody ready? Okay. And I'm going to turn off the stars and let's see if we can find something way over here in the south. Way over here in the south in the summertime, one of the constellations that you might find easy to see, especially if you let a little bit more time go by. So I'm going to let one more hour go by so it gets nice and dark. But throughout the summer, it's, it's in the south over here. I see some stars that are shaped like, you could say it's a fish hook or you could say it's a scorpion with a tail and a stinger. Sophia, do you see anything that might be a fish hook or a tail with a stinger of a scorpion? Lily see, does. It, and, and it also looks like it's a different color too. Yes, there's a star there that's a different color. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
for everyone else that is with us, you might see that as well. Um, and if you could draw it, if you could annotate it. Um, Sherelle, would you mind annotating? What, can you find the scorpion? If you can, go ahead and annotate it, Sherelle. And Sophia, you're welcome to as well if you, if you think you wanna draw it. We've got a guess there. That's a great guess, but it's not quite right. It's oh, it's something else. You're drawing something else. That's a good guess. It, I see it. It's only here. I see. Close. Not quite right. Sorry. There. Somebody's got it. Somebody. I got did it. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Okay, sure I did, but I'm gonna take the credit. <laughs> Shame on you, Sophia. <laughs> so, um, so what you're seeing there is you are indeed seeing part of the tail of the Big Dipper. Um, or not the Big Dipper, I'm sorry, the scorpion. So our scorpion, I'm going to move him over here to the center of the screen, has a tail and it looks like a fish hook. So the Polynesians, they said that this was the fish hook holding up the sky, the story you might hear in Hawaii. Um, but in many other cultures, people saw it as a scorpion, both in Central America and in Europe, in the Mediterranean area, this, they saw a scorpion here. And the star here, it's sort of an orangish reddish color. Its name is Antares. It means not Mars. Literally the star's name is not Mars, anti-Aries because the sun and the planets, as they go around the sun, happen to pass pretty close to Antares. And so you might confuse it with Mars because it's close to the same color as Mars. So our scorpion there is a mortal enemy of the hero Orion. Orion is only up in the sky when the scorpion is not. They, they were fighting, they had a little fight and, and um, uh, Orion stepped on the scorpion and the scorpion stung Orion's foot and um, so they're placed in opposite corners of the sky. The scorpion is up in the summertime and Orion is up through the winter. So, Miss Christine, yes. how do they get their names? They have cool names. They have pretty cool names. Different constellations have names from different traditions. Orion is an ancient Greek and Roman hero. And uh, so he, uh, and, and some of the constellations like the scorpion, some of these actually originated even before the Greeks and the, and the Romans. Some of these originated back during the Babylonian times. Many of the constellations started with Babylonians and then they were adopted by the Greeks and then those were adopted by the Romans. However, there are lots of other versions as well. And there's a question here about getting an archive of this webinar. Um, and so Brooks, do you wanna chime in about, about uh, the webinar? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Uh, yes, we'll have uh, an archived version of this. Um, it'll be up on YouTube live pretty much right away. And then we'll have the Zoom version, which is a little bit more interactive, up in about uh, one day. And um, I can send everybody a note once it is just saying, hey, here's the here's the recording. So I'll, I'll plan to do that tomorrow afternoon. And um, so um, there's a lot of different stories from different cultures, not just Greek and Roman and Babylonian. I am going to now move us over to face the east. Everybody hang on tight. We're gonna move over here to face the east and you can see some interesting things rising here in the east. Um, and there are three bright stars, one, two, and three. Everyone see those three bright stars? Yes. Um, the, um, it reminds me of a shape. A shape, what shape is that, Sophia? A pizza. <laughs> a triangle. I'm hungry. I hear you. Pizza sounds really good right now. Um, so we have our, <laughs> um, our summer triangle here. And our summer triangle comes from three different constellations. The first one, Vega here, is part of the constellation of Lyra the Lyre. It's a Greek harp. The second one, Deneb, is part of the tale of Cygnus the swan. Cygnus is also sometimes called the summer, um, is called the northern uh, um, cross because it's in the shape of a cross. And then the last one over here, Altair, is part of the heart of Aquila the eagle. But again, different people saw these in different ways. 
Vega up here, part of our squash square, which isn't that far from Hercules, by the way. Hercules is right next to Vega up here. Um, and there is a story when Hercules was a little boy, he was taking music lessons and he, um, he, he didn't finish learning how to play the harp. He got really angry and he broke his harp on his music teacher's head. He never finished. That's not good. That's he not shouldn't good. have given up. He shouldn't. And that's why you never see him playing the harp in any of the movies or anything. You never see Hercules playing the harp because, yeah. So anyway, um, the liar here, Viga, in many Asian cultures, so in Korea and Japan and China and Vietnam, Viga here is depicted as, as a princess, or as a weaver princess. Um, sometimes as a goddess. Um, so our princess up here used to weave cloth. And down here, the star Altair in those same cultures is a cow herder. Or if we want to, we could say, you know, he's a rancher um, herd, herding cattle. And the two of them fell in love. Mm -hmm. And they started spending all their time together, according to some versions of the story but they weren't doing their jobs. The weaver princess, she wasn't weaving cloth anymore. So you could imagine all the animals were running, probably running around naked. And the <laughs> cow herder, he wasn't keeping an eye on those cattle and they were getting into everything. So according to the legends, the weaver princess's father, who was in charge of the sky, he put a band across the sky, separating them, a river, in, in these Asian cultures and in Egypt as well, ancient Egypt, this is a river across the sky. And this river separated the two, so they were very sad. And they went back to their work and they did their jobs, but they were sad because they couldn't date anymore. So one night in the middle of summer, on the seventh night of the seventh moon, blackbirds called magpies flew up into the sky and they made a bridge over that river with their wings so that the two could go on a date night. Mm. And so in these cultures throughout Asia and some here in the United States as well, we have celebrations of the summer festival. The Japanese name for it is Tanabata, but each culture has a different name for this festival. And it's not still always on the seventh night of the seventh month, but sometimes it is where the two star-crossed lovers get to spend the night, a date night. And it's sort of it's sort of a Valentine's night. It's a romantic holiday that's celebrated all over the world now, thanks to these ancient legends about these two star-crossed lovers. In, uh, in the real night sky, this band isn't really a river. The Pawnee Indians said it was smoke from campfires from spirits on their way into heaven. The Romans and the Greeks, they didn't say it was a river. They said it was milk. Mm. Do you think we call it the Snickers bar or the Twix bar? Sophia, what do you think we call it? I think it's, could it be? Could it be? Could it be the Milky Way? <laughs> it is. That's the Milky Way you can see there in the sky. And yes, Ryan, you're absolutely right. Our Milky Way is prominent in the summer sky. And I see a Shirelle, absolutely. It is, we, we, we're gonna be finishing up here. Um, the Milky Way is prominent in our summer sky and you can see its band across the sky and it runs all the way through Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle, all the way over to the Scorpion. So Miss Christine, yes. excuse me, what makes the, the, what makes the, the clouds in the Milky Way? What makes the clouds in the Milky Way? These clouds aren't real. Well, some of them are real clouds in the sky. Um, clouds of gas and dust in our galaxy that are glowing hot from stars. But a lot of what we're seeing here is actually billions and billions, hundreds of billions of stars. Oh, so wow. So if we look in this direction or this direction, we might not see any stars because there's a big cloud of dust there blocking our view. Um, but in other directions, billions and billions of stars. And the middle of our galaxy is near that tail of the scorpion. Here's our scorpion and his tail. Mm -hmm. And right above his tail over here in the direction of, um, and there's lots of clusters of stars here too. Um, 
But in this direction, near the teapot, near Sagittarius, in the constellation of Sagittarius, near the arrow here of Sagittarius, is the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way. So we're seeing our galaxy from the inside out. And we're going to do an activity now about our galaxy from the outside in. So we started off with an activity about making your own Sky Heroes constellations. And we sort of did constellation detectives where I let you find things. And I didn't tell you, but over here, this bright thing is a planet. If you wait up tonight pretty late until the stars all come out and they get high in the sky, you'll be able to see Jupiter in the night sky. And if you wait until later, you'll be able to see Saturn is up there. And if you wait until before sunrise, you get up before the sun, you'll see Mars there in the sky as well. But what I'd like to do now is I'm going to stop sharing that. And Sherelle, I'm going to invite you to share your camera so that we can see your camera as you tell us more about the Milky Way galaxy. So you're showing your camera, but can you do a share screen and share your camera using share screen? So that way we can all see your camera front and center, nice and big. Will it let you do that? Uh, I am, no. No. Um, um, when you pick share screen, do advanced and see if it'll let you share your camera under advanced option. So the portion of my screen looks like this. Um, but but it, it's not under advanced, it's not giving you an option. Um, go ahead and um, let me try, let me try here and see. Do you see how one of the advanced options is content from second camera? Choose yes. that, choose that, and then switch which camera it's using. There we go. All right, this way awesome. we can all see your camera nice and big. Thank you so oh. much. Okay, that's awesome. Well, we're that's definitely um, putting on some on the job training or some um, troubleshooting. So I'm actually happy that that happened because um, as you are putting together your program, um, nine times out of 10, we know that um, mishaps are inevitable. So it's nice to uh, be able to tr uh, troubleshoot them live and we are live. So <laughs> anywho, okay, so I wanted to show you another interactive um, activity which would involve the pinwheel galaxy all right so on the um, starnet website there are um, of course limitless activities but as Brooke referenced that's actually one of the uh, activities that was displayed and so when you're printing them out here is the pinwheel spiral galaxy template and um, me and my kiddos Jordan and Donovan we created our own so here I have, um, I've modified it some because we're at home and we want to make sure that we are not just sticking with exactly what's on the directions, but if you have other things that work, please use them. All right. So here's my pinwheel galaxy. And according to the instruction, it wanted us to use the chenille stick or uh, it's also called a pipe cleaner, but I didn't have any. I didn't have any. So guess what I used? One of my uh, most favorite things in the world is coffee, yay! Okay, so I use the co coffee syrup because it's very sturdy. And then um, um, for the Chanel stick, it's easy for you to, it's flexible, right? So you can wrap it around a stick that you have, but I didn't have that. So I used a coffee stir and a rubber band. <laughs> and I just took one of my uh, daughter's rubber bands and wrapped it around the front here and the back here, right? And it was able to secure it just fine. And if you're wondering if it works, let's see. It works, yay, okay? And then for your students or for your patrons, um, you would get a blank template as I showed before. Uh -oh, here we go, show it before. And this is from my son, he designed his same concept, same thing, but he didn't have it at the end. He told me he didn't want it at the end. So he changed it. And that's what's so great about it. They can create their own. It doesn't have to, it doesn't go in any uh, certain order, right? So um, he designed his. And then Jordan, this is hers. All right. So have fun with creating a pinwheel galaxy. Thank you so much, Sherelle. Thank you so much. 
Um, we are, um, let's see, now is the time where we're going to do some discussion and Q&A with you all. We invite all of you. Um, so um, um, Belinda and Lily uh, and Sherelle, um, I'd like you to share your cameras as well. And um, for all of our, our attendees, we'd like to hear more from you in terms of, of what you thought, what questions you have, how you can use this for virtual programs. Are you already doing virtual programs about the night sky in, in terms of sky stories and how is that going? And what modifications would you make? I also wanted to start, well, so please feel free to start entering your ideas, your concepts in the chat box and questions in the Q&A. And while you're doing that, um, Belinda and Lily, tell us a little bit more about using Sophia in your virtual programs. Well, one of the things that we've noticed is whenever we use Sophia, the kids tend to participate more because they think it's the coolest thing to be able to speak to a puppet. And when Sophia mentions their name, you know, we get co positive comments, we get positive feedback, and you don't have to be, you know, really good at working with puppets. You just, even if your lips are moving and you're, you're speaking, of course, for the puppet, the kids are so focused on the puppet, they're not looking at you anymore. So that's the fun part of working with any kind of puppet. So a lot of kids might be a little nervous to ask the questions as well. So then the mm -hmm. puppet will act like a conduit and maybe with her speaking, they'll feel more comfortable to speak up or ask their questions. And Lily, you're saying it's like super exciting for a kid to hear, you know, if they, if they get called out of there, if Sophia yeah. were to say their name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one thing that we even do during uh, our virtual story time. Mm -hmm. um, Sophia will say hello and, and show do a shout out to the kids and and you know say we miss you and and show say names. And sometimes when the kids come to the library, like today, um, one of the kids said, "Oh, we saw Sophia on story time," and they said my name, and they were really excited about that. And then they they even asked, "Can she say my name again?" So the kids really like hearing. Sophia say their name. And even if it's something so simple, um, it really means a lot to them. Mm -hmm. And I like making you friends too. <laughs> it, it made me smile throughout this presentation. It was, I was, I really enjoyed having that extra, extra level of interactivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that we found in um, virtual programs is there's a lot of shyness at the beginning and kids are uh, and adults too are, are reticent to, to share, to speak or to talk or to even type things in. So anything to get over that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and particularly for programs like this, where if you're working with more than a dozen kids, more than a dozen people, you might not want to let them share their microphones. And it's really hard to story tell if you don't have part of your audience reacting. So. Mm -hmm. So Paula has an idea there. We hope to engage a second staff member for each program to be the producer so that the person handling the tech issue is. And I, Sherelle and I often work uh, together um, it, for virtual programs. So that way, one of us is helping with one aspect while the other person, and, and we can flip flop. Also, that's helpful in case we're both working from home. If my internet starts to go out, she's there and vice versa in case one of us has a problem where we have to you know, call in on our phone because our internet just went out. So uh, I want to mention, I want to just piggyback on what you said, Christine, and um, to talk about slides. Um, just as Christine was saying, um, you know, technology is great when it works, but when it's not or we're offline, what she has instructed both of us to do is share our slides if they're going to be a, a slide presentation. So if she goes off slide, offline, then the show can continue on, on, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so um, I shared some things in the chat about Native American stories. Um, we have recordings that you can play. Um, the, the artists have not given us permission to post them on the website live. We have recordings that were created through an NSF program and we can give you those recordings and you can play them during your story times, virtual, but you can't record your story time and then post it on the internet because then that violates what the what one of the artists uh, preferences are. 
Um, and so we can, um, and, and so Brooks, Brooks will help us get you access to those. Um, and then there's books. There's a lot of books with Native American stories in them. Um, there is some sensitivity over people who are not Native American taking Native American stories and telling them. Um, so beware of that. And if you have the opportunity to invite a storyteller to come join you and to give that presentation, that's awesome. Um, Christine, I was actually in a session yesterday that covered that and they had a wonderful list, a book list of um, what they really recommended as really uh, uh, good, um, told by indigenous folks um, stories and, and what they had maybe some books that had been used before that weren't um, maybe a little stereotypical and, and not written by um, indigenous authors. So let me pop that in the chat. Um, pull, I'll pull it from my email and, and put it in. Wonderful. There. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, so Vera said that she's virtual programming this March. It's the first time and there is a learning curve. Absolutely. And it, uh, staying connected, filming things uh, and having those available is great. Absolutely. And Kathy uh, used the activities during the eclipse in 2017. Awesome. Um, and adapting these, it, there's ways to adapt them virtually so that way you're demonstrating them or the kids are using materials that they have in the house to do them at the same time. So. What other thoughts or questions? Oh, um, there's, um, in terms of if you're doing a virtual program with your audience, um, depending on how you're inviting them and you've got kids participating, you may not want to let them share their video camera or their microphone if you don't know if anyone's going to potentially crash your party and, and bomb it and, and share things that are inappropriate. Um, on the other hand, if you're pretty confident it's a small group and you can quickly turn them off, letting them share their video camera and practicing with them using their microphones gives you that interaction that's really nice. Um, so. Um, Christine, I'm hearing a lot of questions about like the logistics of, of facilitating a, a virtual program. And I just wanted to say our last webinar uh, was called Behind the Scenes with StarNet 101. And it was just kind of talking about how we put on our webinars. Um, and then we kind of asked and polled library staff about how they're doing their virtual programs. Um, so I'll drop that link in too. And that might be really helpful for you to hear about like from library staff nationwide. Um, it's, some of our tips are good, but you know, we're working with library staff and not actual patrons. Um, so I will, I'll put that in there. And we covered a lot of those kind of tips and things to think about, like people that you might not want to join your Zoom room. <laughs> so do all of you have tips? Um, last minute links to reduce Zoom crashers. That's sending a last minute link. That's a great thing. And yes, and as a security feature, doing your registration. Absolutely. What other tips do you all have for doing virtual programs, in particular sky programs? If you're trying to share this idea of storytelling and night sky this summer, um, in your programs, what other tips or what other questions do you have? What other things, issues and challenges do you have that um, that we might be able to together brainstorm some solutions to? Being the astronauts, uh, this is virtual programs is a great way to to demonstrate that mission control and order is awesome. That's a great idea, Jane. Lovely. And that, that reminds me of the strange new planet activity where you're mm -hmm. uh, discovering a new planet and you have to communicate your your stories back and forth or what you're seeing and why you need more funding to go and further explore the planet. And you kind of develop your own narrative and your own story. So I could see that really tying in well with 2020. Absolutely. Strange new planet can be awesome. And does anyone have any other questions about the night sky or constellations that you want to see or hear the answers to while we're also thinking and brainstorming? We've got just a couple minutes left, so. And, uh, one question that was asked early on in the webinar today was about whether Stellarium would work with the Linux platform. Um, I personally haven't used that. Christine, I don't know if you have, but I saw that it is, you can download a version for, uh, for Linux. Yeah. Um, we should stipulate that the, the computer software, whether it's for Apple or for, you know, Dell, for Linux, uh, is free. If you're using the app for a tablet or a phone, there is a fee for that. Um, but, the, but the downloadable software is free.
Which free apps do you prefer? Folks, what other apps do you all like to use? Um, Brooks, do you want to talk a little bit about any are some of the apps that that you folks have developed available for some of, for everyone? You know, I, I oh oh we yeah we should certainly have some uh, mobile apps. I was thinking about you know virtual or augmented reality sky apps, and I know there's a few, but I always get the names wrong, like Skywalker maybe or anyway. Uh, we have um, some wonderful apps uh, developed for like digital games and digital STEM experiences. So if you're thinking about um, how you can get your your patrons engaged in STEM, even though you might not be able to, to do a Zoom presentation, or maybe you're, you're having a hard time doing a virtual program, um, our Sci Games website, and um, I'll pull the link up and, and drop it in really quick. It's uh, different, fun, interactive, engaging games um, that we've developed over the past 10 years or so. Um, and we're, we're starting to put those more in the iOS or uh, in the app stores on Android and, and starting to get a little bit of um, uh, in the iTunes stores too, I think. I might be misspeaking about that, but I'll drop a link in for that. It's a, it's a lot of fun stuff like Magneto Mini Golf or Planet Families where you're developing your own solar system and kind of working with the physics of, of gravity. Um, so really cool game. Thanks, that's a good plug, Christine. Awesome. Um, it, um, and Sherelle pointed out Skyview. Um, Stellarium actually was started more than a decade ago, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So for those of you, someone said their operating platform is kind of old. There might be an older versions of Stellarium when you go to the website that lets you um, use that. And yes, you can use it to look at the moon phases. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I'm going to really quickly reopen it and, and share it again. And we're going to do a really quick demo of it with moon phases while you all are thinking and asking other questions as well. So I, I am starting from today again. I'm going to uh, zoom out here and move this nice and down tight here. And um, you can see the moon is there. Um, it, the auto default is you have to really zoom in to see the face. However, you can change that under settings, under sky view options. I'm going to select scale moon and I'm going to make it enormous, not just four times its size. I'm going to make it 20 times its size. And um, and now, <laughs> now you're going to be able to see the moon phase um, pretty easily. And so um, right now, it's hard to see the moon. It's kind of close to the sun in the sky. Um, if you go out today, right now, and try to look for it, um, look to the west of the sun. However, we can change dates as well. We're going to change dates. So tomorrow it's going to be even closer to the sun and new moon. It's not actually going to cover up the sun here in the U.S. We're not going to have a solar eclipse here in the U.S. Um, it will be visible as an eclipse in some places of parts of the world, I think. We're going to change dates here and you can see how it's changing positions with respect to the sun each day. So yes, you can use it for, uh, for moon phases. You can also use it for things like where the sun is in the sky, where it rises and sets during different times of the year. So I'm going to change my time here. And, and so for those of you who are working with kids in classrooms, this is great. You can uh, see how our seasons change during the year. This is June um, when the sun is setting, here in Houston anyway. Uh, back up a tiny bit. So you can see it setting in the Northwest and then July, August towards the West, September towards the West, um, and then October. So you can show all sorts of different things with it. Absolutely. And we've only got a couple minutes left. Any final questions with relate to Stellarium or anything else that you want to see? And I'll close it again. Uh, Greg, I was wondering if you would mind dropping the um, certificate of attendance in the chat. Actually, um, excuse me, if, if you would drop the SurveyMonkey link in the chat, and then there's a certificate of attendance as well. And we just ask that you complete that post webinar survey. We're going to ask you a little bit about this uh, night sky program, and um, we just want to know how kind of did it change your per your opinion? Were you coming into this thinking, eh, and now you're like, yes, definitely, or you know, just what's your opinion on doing this as a library program? Ask you a little bit about the webinar experience in general, and just any tips or anything like that that you have about our webinars or things that you would like to see. We'd love the feedback. 
And just to uh, mention, we had Solarium maybe like a week or two ago, mm -hmm. and it was really, really successful. The kids really liked it, and we got really good comments about, you know, all the stuff we talked about. We've partnered with LPI before, and our kids really liked the Stardom that we borrow, but this was definitely a worthy um, program to kind of take its place, and they really, really enjoyed it. We hope all of you have some ideas now, and, and we hope that you will be able to use these for your own programs. Um, we're really, really glad you uh, came and joined us for this past hour, and uh, wanted to tell Sophia and Lily and Belinda, thank you for joining us as well, and for your help demonstrating things. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all. Yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, keep an eye out. We'll, we'll be announcing another webinar pretty soon, and uh, we'll get to see our uh, wonderful friends, Christine and Sherelle, and hey, I don't know, maybe Sophia too, um, on another I webinar in, just a, in a few weeks. So um, keep your eyes peeled. Um, we'll be redirected to the survey, and we hope to see you soon. Have a great day. Have a great weekend too. Bye. Gracias, amigos. We'll see you later. Hasta luego.